They're arrogant and bluster and boisterous. That was them. Just character. It's Wednesday night, and our study is on the Old Testament. What we're doing, we're going through the Bible. We started with Genesis. We went through every chapter in Genesis, every character from Genesis 1 through Genesis 50. Of course, that took us from Adam in the first chapter, Adam in the, excuse me, Adam in the second chapter, the beginning in the first chapter, then Adam in the second chapter, that's where he was formed of the dust of the ground. God formed Adam. Formed is not create. The word formed is the word yatsar. Yatsar is the same word as potter. In the, that's in the Greek text. Same word as potter. And he formed Adam. Formed. So he made the body. And then the Bible says he breathed into Adam the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And David said in the Psalms that God creates with his breath. So when, he, when God breathed out in Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created. Created the heavens and the earth. So all the heavens and the earth were created in verse 1. Create is the word bara. It is a derivative of the word barith. And Barith is the word covenant. Covenant. So, God creates in the first chapter, and then the earth becomes without form and void. One and two. Genesis 1 and 2 becomes without form. Of course, the word without form is the word T-O-H-U-W. Tohu. When in Isaiah 45, 18... The Bible says that God said, I created the earth to inhabit it. I created nothing in vain. Did not create. He said, I did not. Not create in vain. So, whatever in vain is, he said, that's not what I created. I created the earth to be inhabited. Well, create is not the word formed. It's not the word made. It's not the word made. Whenever you find that God made the earth in six days, that's not the word create. Made has to do with forming, like Yatsar. It's like a potter on a potter's wheel takes some clay, puts it on a potter's wheel, pumps the potter's wheel, dips his hand in water and shapes something. That's a shaping. That's the forming. When he said, I did not create in vain, therefore, this word in vain, it's one word in the Hebrew, it's the word tohu. Oh, that's the same word, is the earth became without form, tohu. So God says, what's going on in the second verse is not what I created in the first verse. So something happens between the first and second verses. Isn't that right? Something had to happen. Well, we know he created the heavens... And the heavens and the earth in the first verse, well, the heavens would be the stars, the sun, the moon, etc., up in the sky. Stars are all suns. They're big bodies of gas. They're gaseous bodies. And they're all... Stars give off light. Planets have no light. We have our solar system. Our solar system is made up of planets other than our sun. Our sun is a star, and it's one of the smallest stars in all the universe. So, a planet, we get the word planetase. We get planet from planetase. And we talk about the doctrine of the devil on Sunday night, and we talk about being seduced and deceived, one of the words deceived that's used often, one of the words deceive is the word planetase or planeo, which means to cause to err. 
It means a wanderer. So whenever you have a sun, you all these planets out here going around the sun, they don't have any light. Our moon has no light. Our moon is a planet. Our moon reflects the light of the sun, doesn't it? That's what it does. So whenever you have something happening, in that second verse, the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the surface or upon the face, face of the deep. Face is the word ponim. You remember the word respect of persons in the New Testament? It's the word prosoapoliteo. Prosoapoliteo. P-R-O-S-O-P-apoliteo. Prosoapoliteo means to look at the surface of something. It comes from the word P-R-O-S-O-P-O-N, prosopon. That's the word face. Face. Your face is your surface, isn't it? That's the part that shines and smiles and puts out a personality. You can't have much personality without a face, can you? It comes from prosopon. Well, this word ponim is the Old Testament word for face. When God would tell Jeremiah, don't be afraid of the faces of the people. Go into the gates of the city. Preach the word of God in the gates. Tell them judgment's coming. Tell them Nebuchadnezzar's going to come and carry them away into captivity. Well, the word face is the word pone, P-A-N-E-H. And ponim is the same word as respect persons. It means to look at the surface and accept the surface. Well, darkness is upon the surface of the deep. So whenever you find without form, void, and darkness, that's the character of Satan, isn't it? Satan. It's the character of Satan. Well, if Satan is cast into the earth, in Luke, the 18th chapter, if he's cast into the earth there, we see, light, we see Satan fall to the earth like lightning, there has to be a place in which Satan was cast in. When we look at Revelation, the 12th chapter, we see a third of the angels of heaven are cast out of heaven by Michael, the archangel, into the earth. What if they're cast out of heaven into the earth? Satan's very nature goes into the earth somewhere in the Bible. When you look at Revelation 12, that is a panoramic view. When I say panoramic, you've heard that word and that don't mean much to you. The word pan, that was the god of the highways. He was also called in the ancient world the God of all. Look at that word all. If you have a camera and you pan the audience, you get all the audience. That's where it comes from. So he was called, called the God of all. And I won't go into that. I started to say something else. Take me too long. So a panoramic view of all time is Revelation 12. In order to find out where Satan was cast into the earth, you've got to go back. Where do you find the first nature of Satan? In Genesis 1, 1 and 1, 2. The creation was not the six days. There's no such thing as six days of creation. God is speaking to the, to the matter and separating the matter in the six days. The creation is in the first verse. And then you've got darkness upon the face of the deep. If darkness is upon the face of the deep, and in the first verse, God creates the heavens, He's created the stars. If you've got stars out here, these stars and some planets out here, planets are not going to help us in this equation. The stars are giving off light and light travels at 186,000 miles per second. It takes eight and a half minutes for light to get to us from the sun. Other than our sun, the nearest star is Alpha Centauri. 
Alpha Centauri, it takes four and a half years for light to get to earth traveling at 186,000 miles per second. Not miles per hour. 186,000 miles every second. It takes four and a half years for light to get here from Alpha Centauri. How long does it take for light to get from some of these stars? 22, 24 million years. Some of the stars that we see at night. The light's been traveling that fast. Can you imagine how fast 186,000 miles per second is? That's moving fast, isn't it? That is moving on. Well, some of these stars, the light's been traveling all this time toward the earth. And when it gets to the earth, darkness is up on the surface of the deep. What is happening to the earth, the scientists tell us there was some kind of cloud there. So when God says in verse 3, let there be light, that's not when he created light. Where did he create light? Verse 1, didn't he? He created the heavens in verse 1. When he says, let there be light, he's demanding that the light come in. And then he starts six work days. These are days of Yatsar. Making and forming, he separates parts of the earth. He separates the waters under the firmament. We have what we call terra firma. Terra firma is what's under our feet, the earth. The firmament was the air up here. The air, the stratosphere, where the birds fly, birds. That's called the firmament. And God took the waters and separated the waters that are above the firmament from the waters that were below the firmament. You have waters under the sky and waters above the sky. That's in the first chapter of Genesis. Why did he put the waters up here? Well, in Hebrews, the first chapter, 11th chapter, the Bible says that Noah being warned of God of things not seen as yet. At Noah's time, from Adam... From Adam to Noah was 1,656 years. 1,656 years. It had never rained from Adam to Noah. Noah being one of God of things not seen as yet. It had never rained before. Well, where'd the water come from? Where did that water come from when the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were open? Where did it come from? The water was set up there in the heavens above the firmament before the foundation, when the world was being redone, re-pottered, put on the potter's wheel. God stuck the waters up there well, where did the earth get its water? There was a mist that went up from the, from the ground to water the earth in Genesis, the second chapter. That's where they got their water from the mist. Why did they live so long? Probably because of the mist. What do you put in your child's room whenever they have a cold and you want to make them well? Put a you know, humidifier in the room, don't you? If you had a humidifier that could cut out all the ultraviolet rays, we might live to be two or three hundred years old. It's the ultraviolet rays is killing us. It's poisoning our system. So, how did I get into this? I don't know. But I love this subject. What we see in Genesis, the first chapter, I put it on the board once in a while. Here's what we see. Let me just show you this. God gave us a picture. We preach predestination here. People don't like that. The Bible says, For whom he did foreknow, 
He also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of His Son. That verse changed my life at about 21 years old. When a guy quoted it to me, I was raised in a Baptist preacher's home. I never heard it in my life. And my heart started pounding. It scared me. It excited me. In a couple of days, I said, I've got to believe this, and I've got to believe that God is mathematical on everything He does. If it don't add up, don't you believe it. I don't care who's preaching it. If it leaves definition, you can't believe it. Well, then why don't the world see all these things? Paul said, the day of the Lord will not come except there come a falling away first. The falling away is here. And Paul said in that second chapter of 2 Thessalonians, the falling away is already here. He called it the mystery of iniquity. Falling away is the word apostasis. It comes from the little word apo, meaning a removal. This is falling away. That's the word falling. It's falling away looks like two words. Well, it is, but it's one word in the Greek. Apostasis. The word apostasion. Every time you find the word divorce or divorcement, it is the word apostasion. It is a derivative of apostasis. It means to stand, stasis from stasis, and apo. Apo means apart or away from. It means to stand away from Christ. It means to divorce Christ. The church has divorced His words. They don't believe in predestination. They, don't believe, they believe that God loves everybody. And He doesn't. He loved Jacob and hated Esau before either one were born, before either one had done any good or evil. That's the truth. Now, here's what God has done in the first chapter. He's given us a picture of the rest of the Bible. Of the rest of the Bible. We're, we're going through the Bible. We've been going through Genesis. You have the earth. You have the creation. And create, like I said, is the word bara. It means to cut and make fat. Fat to the Jewish mind didn't mean that cellulite right there. That's not what it meant. It meant the leanest, the best of the cattle, the best of the crops. When the Bible speaks of the fat of the land, you'll go in and you'll see the fat of the land of Israel. It'll be a, it'll be a land of milk and honey. That means there'll be bees everywhere, that they'll be getting the pollen from the trees, and they had the... In the rocks, if you remember the 14th chapter of 1 Samuel, uh, when Jonathan stood up against the Philistines and God loved his, loved his boldness, he gave him an earthquake and him and his, Jonathan and his armor bearer, which was the best warrior in his company, Jonathan and his armor bearer whipped, killed 20 Philistines and then God says, I'll send you an earthquake to help you in that. On the way home, Jonathan was he was in a cave of rocks and he just reached out with his rod and swept some honey off of the side of the wall and ate it. The land of flowing with milk and honey means there's lots of flowers and lots of wheat and lots of crops. That's what it means. And the udders of the goats will, and the cattle will be so distended the, the milk will be <laughs> bursting from their udders and it will be flowing on the ground. Now, create means to make the very best. And, of course, we get the word covenant from that. Do you think that that's what God created in verse 2? Without form, void, and darkness? No, that's the nature of Satan. Between those two verses is when Satan, by mathematical deduction... When you find the nature of Satan, that's where he has to be cast into the earth. 
because you find His nature right there in verse 2, without form, void, darkness. Now, what this is showing us, it's going to show a picture of all the rest of the Bible. I love the first chapter of Genesis. It is a magnificent chapter because we see the earth is created in that verse 1, isn't it? Huh? And the earth is a picture of innocence. Innocence. And this is a picture of man. That is elect of God. Created in his innocence. And then when God looses Satan on our lives, when we come to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and we know right from wrong, then darkness enters the depth of our hearts. And God has an elect family for whom He did foreknow. The people, the whoms He foreknew, and it's just like the earth. This was like it was God's earth and He knew it and He's going to give life to the earth, isn't He? So whom He did foreknow, the people, the hoos, masculine gender. It is a relative pronoun referring back to Romans 8, 29, 28. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that who are the called. That's the church. Church is the word ecclesia. It means the called out of God. E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A. That's called out. Kaleo, ek, out. Comes from kaleo, means to call out. We've been called out of this world. And God has feminine. That's the church. That's us. So that's the... Well, let's don't get into that right now, David. There's too many things to get into. The earth is like the elect of God. God picks the earth out. People say the earth is not the center of the universe. The reason they say that is our Milky Way, it takes 100,000 years to get across our galaxy, the Milky Way that we live in, in traveling at the speed of light. Just the galaxy we live in takes a hundred thousand years for light to cross our galaxy. That's a pretty big God, isn't it? Oh, by the way, they believe there's about 400 million more galaxies. Not planets, not suns, galaxies. We don't have any idea how great this God is we serve. And we think we're important enough to argue with him when he says something. When you look at those pictures up there along the wall, kind of gives you an idea. Our sun starts off real large on the one end of it, and when it gets down to Antares and Betelgeuse, I guess the way you pronounce it, our sun is a pixel. Just one little pixel upside these. It's amazing. So, darkness enters the depth of our hearts and then God says, let there be light. And this one, I've chosen the earth above all the planets of all the universes of all the galaxies to be my earth. Now, the earth is on the outer borders of the Milky Way, which is our galaxy. It's on the borders out here. Well, people say, well, it's not the center of the universe. It is to God. It's the only one of these planets he gave his son to die for the inhabitants of. So he picks out an earth. Other planets, Jesus didn't go die for the Martians. 
He didn't die for the Venetians. He didn't die for the people from Jupiter or from some far away, uh, what does it say in the Star Wars? Far away planet or something into the way unknown. He didn't die for them. He died for us. So he picks out an earth out of everything and is going to, send, going to create a man on the earth and send Jesus to die for man and nobody else. That's a picture of us. When God says, let there be light, in that this is sovereignty of God. This is predestination, isn't it? Did God say, let there be light? And the earth says, well, if somebody will give me an invitation to him, I'll let the light into my heart. <laughs> Just as I am. No, I don't think so. When God says that, I've said this so many times, when he gives us an imperative mood in the Greek, imperative. Now, Jesus is the God of the Old Testament, isn't he? Isn't he Jehovah? He said before Abraham was, I am. And the I am God in Exodus, the third chapter, he says, I am. And the Pharisees said, you're not 50 years old and you've seen Abraham. He said, before Abraham was, I am. And they got mad enough to want to kill him. He called himself the I am God of the Old Testament. When he said, gives an imperative command, this is Jesus. When Jesus gives an imperative mood in the Greek. When the Bible was written, New Testament, it was written in the Greek text. We have that right here. Well, I got one it's here somewhere. It's called an interlinear Bible. Most of you have one. It has the Greek on the top line. I don't even trust the English. Don't ever trust the English. I have to try to explain to you what it says in English since we all speak English. I bet people say, well, if it's written in Greek, won't you teach in Greek? First of all, this is a dead language. We go back and we can look at the definition of the words. I can parse the verbs. I can tell you if it's a participle, a verb, a noun, an adverb. And what, the modif what they modify, there's the text right there, the Greek on the top line, the English right under it. And that's the truth. English is not the correct language. We have to read it in English because that's what we speak, right? Now, when he says, let there be light, that's the same thing as all the imperative moods of the New Testament Greek. When God would say, strive to enter in at the straight gate. Strive is the word agonizomai. The agon... It comes from agon. It's our word agonize. And the agon was the arena like that and on the wall over there with the lions about to attack the Christians. That was the agon. God is saying, get in the agon and agonizomai. Agonize. We get the word agony from that. We have to agonize over sin. That's an imperative mood. It's a command given by Jesus in Luke 13, 24. Well, if Jesus is the I Am in the New Testament, and He was the I Am of the Old Testament, and He says, let there be light, is light going to come in to this break-in and circumcise that barrier around the earth and let the light in? It's going to happen. In your life, if he says agonize over sin, it's going to happen in your life. Isn't it? If he says humble yourself under the hand of God, T-A-P-E-I-N-O-O. -O, that's the word humble. It means to level the mountain of self. Because like we've said, demons are self, aren't they? Jesus said they were. When he rebuked the man, he rebuked him, A-U-T-O. That is our word, auto. An automobile is self-mobile. He rebukes self. There in Mark, the first chapter, and Luke, the fourth chapter. So he sang, level self. You say, Jim, he's commanding me to do it. I don't know how to do it. Well, certainly you don't know how. How does it come about? Here's how it comes about. He must increase, 
I must decrease. Self must decrease. This is how self is humbled. When you're young, you don't know how to do it. And when you get old, God has taught you through fire and trials. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. There was some strange thing happening to you. Tribulation. We must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. Persecution. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You have to be persecuted, tribulation, and the more Christ increases, He has to increase Jesus. And it will be through all these trials, our minds and our life will get on Jesus. That's not something you can do. When He says, let there be light, Jesus is the light, and that is an imperative command over here, and it's an imperative command over here to humble self. If we humble self, we decrease, and He increases in our lives. And when we increase, we get hungry for this word. We want to know what it means. We read it, we study it, and if you don't, if you're new at this, if you'll come and sit down here and just open up your Bible, I'll teach it to you. You don't have to learn. You don't have to go all the 58 years I've been studying to learn it. It was very difficult. God had to give me some kind of special desire. You know what I believe I have more than anything else? I don't believe it's intelligence. I've got an unbelievable amount of perseverance. I'll do it or die trying. That's the way I was out in the world when I was in real estate. I will make money or die. And I do the same thing in the Bible. I say, I will do this, and I will not stop. If you do that about 50 years, you'll get to where you know something. If you want to learn. Or if you'll come here and sit out and put these words down. So, when he says humble, when he says be angry, that's an imperative mood. Or gizomai. That is a command. That These commands are coming from the living God just like let there be light and light comes in our life and it increases and that's faith increasing. Besides all this, I'll give all diligence. Add to your faith. Add to death to self. Faith is death to self, isn't it? It's what it is. Now, so when he says, let there be light, you can take every imperative mood in the New Testament. That is the living God commanding these things to happen in our life a little at a time over a long period of time. You can't do this yourself. If God's dealing with your heart, you're going to commit to truth regardless of who you offend, and that won't happen all at once either. It'll happen very slowly. You'll start believing predestination, pro ho rizzo, whom he did for no, he also did pro ho rizzo. This is amazing. Back to let there be light. Pro ho rizzo means to pre bound inside the light. Ho rizzo is our word horizon. The horizon is the light, isn't it? That's the light. Where the light shines. Remember, forgiveness, alphesis, means to pardon and release from prison. And the word prison is the word fulake. And that means the division of day and night or of light and darkness. And that's the horizon. And that's the light or that's Jesus that's going to increase in our life when he says, let there be light. And that's just the beginning of the work in us, isn't it? When he says, let there be light, that is the beginning of our life as a believer. But do you stay right there where you are? No, you have to grow. The apostle said, Lord, increase our faith in Luke, the 17th chapter. He said, what do you do to increase your faith? You work all day long, and 
the all day that he's talking about is your lifetime. And at the end of your lifetime, Jesus is everything. And you are nothing. And you say, I am an unprofitable servant. I've done nothing. It's simply grace that has brought me here. Now, let there be light. And then what does he do? Well, he starts six work days. Six is the work of man. Work days of man. And did not Jesus rest on the seventh day? These are not days of creation. These are days of making and forming. And six is always the number of man all through the Bible. It's the number of work days and we see God making and forming all through there. And there's a verse there I like to look at in verse chapter 1. Chapter 1. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But chapter 1. And God said, verse 11, Let the earth bring forth grass and herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind. He didn't say, I'm creating the seed here. The seed was in the original muck that Satan corrupted between verses 1 and 2. The seed was here in chapter 1, verse 1, before it was corrupted, wasn't it? And on what day does it come forth and bring life? Keep reading. Whose seed is in itself. He said it's already there in the muck or in the chaos. Upon the earth, and it was so, and the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind. And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. What day does the resurrection come on? Life comes forth on the third day, does it? And he works six Six work days of man. God is working six days. He's not creating six days. The creation is in the first verse. And when he creates, he breathes life. Now, I wanted you to see that, to see that the first chapter of Genesis, and this is not all there is to it, that is the beginning, what God is doing. He's giving us, us a precursor to the entire Bible here. He's got a people he picks out just like he picked out the earth. The earth is insignificant. It's in the wrong place. You know what the earth reminds me of? Being out here on the outskirts of the universe. It reminds me of when Jesus speaks and says in Luke 4.18, 4, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. For the Lord hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to the unrecognized. P-T-O-C-H-O-S. Tokas. Poor. It's the same word. Blessed are the poor in spirit in the fifth chapter of Matthew. For theirs is the kingdom of God. You know what he just said when he said that? Look at that in Matthew 5. Look at this. Matthew 5. Blessed are the tokas, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And remember, king, kingdom of heaven, excuse me. Remember, kingdom of heaven Matthew always says kingdom of heaven. This is the first, Jesus first, this is Jesus' first message. He's in Galilee. 
This is called the Sermon on the Mount. Kingdom of Heaven was a term for Israel. Now, this, this Sermon on the Mount is in Matthew, the fifth chapter. It's Jesus' first message. He's in northern Galilee. Matthew 5, 6, 7. That is the Sermon on the Mount. You have Luke's account of the Sermon on the Mount. And Luke's account is in Luke, the sixth chapter. You don't have as much in Luke on the Sermon on the Mount as you do in Matthew. It, I keep saying, whenever you're studying the Bible, when you study Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called these synoptic Gospels. That's because they have a synonymous view. You'll have, sometimes you'll have a, a parable in Matthew and Mark, but won't be in Luke. Sometimes you'll have a parable in Matthew or Mark and Luke, but it won't be in Matthew. Then you may have a something in Luke and Mark that you won't have in Mark. And you may have something in Luke only. You only have the woman taking an adultery in Luke, the eighth chapter. That's the only place you have that. You'll have Jesus walking on the water and all, all of them. You'll have the man of the Gadarenes in Matthew, the fifth chapter, or eighth chapter. You'll have the man of the Gadarenes in Matthew, the fifth, Mark, the fifth chapter, and Luke, the eighth chapter. And John may have some things completely all by himself, and he may have some of these things over here. He's not one of the synoptic gospels. They have a synonymous view of the life of Christ in the gospels. You have to look at things like that. Now, what I was saying here, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Luke says, in Luke's gospel, in the sixth chapter of Luke, he says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Matthew always uses heaven. Where did that come up? Well, about 200 B.C. About 200 B.C., the rabbis in the Babylonian synagogue with their halakha. There we are, back to, back to the traditionary law. The rabbis said that they didn't want to bring reproach of, upon the name God. First of all, name is not God. Name is the word Shem in the Hebrew. It's the word Onoma in the Greek. And it means authority. God's authority is His Word, isn't it? That's His law. That's what He says. That's His name. You have to define the word name. They didn't want to bring reproach, they said, on God, so they took the word God out and inserted the word heaven. And that's why if you're reading Jewish writings by a lot of people, they'll have G-D. You see? You've seen that in books, haven't you? G dash D. So, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is Israel. Kingdom of God was a term for Israel. If Jesus was the God of the Old Testament, and the God of the Old Testament goes to Samuel in 1 Samuel, the 12th chapter, and says, You desired a king among you when God was your king. And he says the same thing in Hosea, the 13th chapter then that means that Jesus, who was the God of the Old Testament, was the king of the Jews long before he came up on the earth, doesn't he? Kingdom of God was a term for Israel, and we are spiritual Israel, aren't we? Paul said, They are not Israel which are of Israel. Only the election hath obtained all this, and the rest were blinded. He tells the Philippian Gentile church, Men, you are the circumcision, which was a term for Israel. We're the circumcision that worship God in spirit, our faith is in Christ, and we have no confidence in the flesh. He said that spiritual Israel or the kingdom of God. A Jew is not outwardly above the heart. Circumcision is of the heart. So the poor in the spirit 
kingdom of God was spiritual Israel. And what's the capital of Israel? Jerusalem. Well, the Bible says, we are come to heavenly Jerusalem, the church. Right? In Hebrews 12, 22. So only the poor in spirit are going to be in the church. Isn't that what he's saying? And I think of this when I think of the earth out here, sitting alone out here by itself, insignificant on the edge of the Milky Way. I think of the earth as just an insignificant planet, and God picked it out to put man on and to send his son to die for. And that's not something you'll hear some astronomer teaching you, will they? So, we have the earth out here. And it's out here. It's the poor. This is why I love to go on TV in cities that are full of minorities. Like Memphis. Like Washington, D.C. Like Queens. Brooklyn. Got a lot of minorities up there. Like we're going on in Detroit, in Cleveland, Milwaukee. Because I know that Jesus said... My elect are the poor and the downtrodden and the broken and the bruised. That's not middle class white Americans, is it? No siree. Middle class, white, middle class white Americans, I believe, are going to hell. Most of them. So when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit, that reminds me of the earth. Well, in fact, let's go down here and look here. And let's read, there's the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. What does that mean? Remember, heavens was a term for the ruling class. And earth was a term for the ruled. We will rule them with a scepter of righteousness, but not in the hereafter, here and now. If you really want to Cause a man to run away from you. Learn some of these Greek words. Learn the text of Scripture and tell it to them and it'll scare them and they'll leave. I've told the story many times. I went into a real estate office years ago when I was in real estate. There was a loud mouth Marine, retired Marine sergeant in there selling real estate. And there was some of these plastic women sitting over there on the couch. You know what I'm talking about? Plastic women. They had their big fancy cars out in the driveway. And I went in to pick up a key to show some how. And he come walking out and said, Man, I feel great today. I feel fantastic. I said, Oh, you must have Jesus in your heart. It was like I took a bucket of water and went... And he started cussing. He said, Well, blankety blank. No, he was embarrassed in front of those hot-looking women over there, real estate agents. He said, no, blankety blank. And I said, well, I can tell by what's coming out of your mouth. You don't have Jesus in your heart because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And he said, i got to go. And he took off out the door. That is ruling the earth. That's what that's called. The earth was the rule. When you hear a man say, I'll move heaven and earth to get this job done. That means I'll move, I'll move powers that be and I'll move everybody. I'll step on everything I have to, the little people. That's what he's talking about here. Now, let's get back over here. You got the six work days and God starts working on the earth. So what you have here is a picture of God's elect. God picks out his family. He hath chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world. He chose the earth of all the planets and all the solar systems and all the universes for man to live on. He picked out this earth to send Jesus to to redeem man upon this earth. In the first chapter of Genesis, this is a picture of the sovereignty of God, predestination, election of God. He elected the earth. And then He said, I'm going to clean it up. It's a magnificent picture of predestination just to understand the first verse. Because when he says, let there be light, he's predestined us, hadn't he? Pre-lightened us. He predetermined the earth for light and he predetermined us for light. Now, 
He said, I didn't choose you in Deuteronomy 7 and 7. I didn't choose you because you were the greatest of nations. You were the smallest. And I'm going to kill everybody else that gets in your way. I will destroy anyone who gets in the way of my church, my wife, my family. Now, let's get back to this history that we're in. We went through Genesis. God created Adam there in that first chapter, creating the earth, and the, created Adam in the third chapter. Tells Adam not to eat of the tree in that second chapter. Then he creates Eve out of Adam's side. And, and then she eats of the tree in the third chapter. And God drives him out of the garden in the third chapter. In the fourth chapter, Cain, the firstborn, kills Abel. Picture Abel is a picture. How in the world did Abel know to offer a blood sacrifice? Was he guessing? No. His father Adam told him because Jesus who walked in the garden with Adam offered a sacrifice to cover their nakedness. I believe it was a lamb. They tried to cover their nakedness with the works of their hands, didn't they? They picked some fig leaves off a tree and said, I'll cover myself with this. God says, that's not good enough. It takes a blood sacrifice and he killed an animal and covered their nakedness and our nakedness has to be covered. Then we went on down. We've gone on down through the book of Genesis. Genesis 4, Cain and Abel. Genesis 5, the lineage of Adam through Seth. Remember, remember Cain's left out. Cain is the bastard son. I'm not going to explain that all right now. Cain, Adam has a son named Seth because over there in that 26th chapter of the 26th verse of the 4th chapter, Adam knew his wife Eve. To know her meant to have a sexual intimate relationship with her and she conceived and bare another in the place of Abel whom Cain slew. Called his name Seth, which means substitute. Seth is in that fifth chapter and from Seth we go all the way down to Noah. These are all sons, father, son, son, grandson, great-grandson, great-great-grandson, all of Adam. All the way down to Noah, and if you count ten great-grandsons from Adam to Noah, Noah was the great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-great-
as it is written, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. Before either one were born, God loved Jacob and hates Esau. And then we go through Jacob trying to deceive in the 27th chapter. At the end of the 25th chapter, he personally steals Esau's birthright. Birthright. In that 27th chapter, he tries to fool his father. And he puts some skin on him and puts some smell of uh, wild smell on him so he'll smell like Esau. And he gets in there with Isaac, his father, and he says, it sounds like Jacob's voice. But you smell like Esau. And he... <laughs> Isn't that funny? It's like Jacob actually thought Isaac was that stupid. People, preachers will read that, and I do not believe that Isaac was fooled for one second. He knew the blessing went to Jacob. Was, Jake, was, es was Isaac married to Rebekah? Did God tell Rebekah, the elder shall serve the younger? Do you think she kept this a secret from, Abraham, from Isaac? No. She told him everything. She said, the elder, Esau, is going to serve Jacob because God says he loved Jacob and hated Esau before they are born. And then Jacob goes off. He runs from his brother Esau and he runs to the land of Haran. Haran is the land of Babylon, or what we call Iraq. He runs from here, way over here, about 650 miles. Of course, when he's leaving town in the 28th chapter, he gets to Bethel. Wasn't called Bethel then until after this vision of the angels going up and down the ladder. He sees the ladder going up and down to heaven there in the 28th chapter. And then in the 29th chapter, he's over there, in the land of Babylon, or Iraq, or Haran. And when he gets over there, he's going to find Laban, his mother's brother. And Laban's got two daughters. One is named Leah. The other's Rachel. He sees Rachel and flips out over her. She is gorgeous. He works seven years for her, and Laban, being the deceiver that he is, gives him Leah. He actually, she goes in the tent with Jacob that night and he thinks he's in bed with Rachel. Next morning he wakes up and goes, what are you doing here? Yeah. Laban lied to him. He said, I worked seven years for her. I'll work seven more for my beloved Rachel. He said, okay. And these two women start having babies in the 29th chapter. They have Jacob's sons and they have Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Gad, Asher, Naphtali. Uh, I'm not remembering them all. Zebulun, Issachar. Well, they, they need to be opposite. And uh, on down to Joseph. Joseph and Benjamin. Now, this becomes the nation of Israel, and Jacob's name is changed to Israel in the 32nd chapter. When he wrestles with the angel of the Lord, and the angel strikes him on the hip, and he cripples him the rest of his life. And Jacob walks with a limp from then on. Then he comes back, meets his brother, scared to death, his brother's going to kill him. And he puts his arms around Jacob, one of the tenderest places in all of Scripture, even though Esau was hated by God, Esau showed mercy because Jacob thought, my brother's going to kill me. I stole his birthright. And then in the 35th chapter, God has told Jacob, leave this country, go back to this land. He takes his wives and his children, and they head back to the land. When they get to Bethlehem, Rachel has Benjamin, the last of Jacob's sons, 12 sons. And she dies that day. Very sad part of Jacob's life. That was his beloved Rachel. And then we see in the 37th chapter, Joseph is the beloved of Jacob, his most loved son. 
Joseph starts having these visions and dreams. And he starts telling his brothers about the dreams, how I had a dream. And we were sheaves in a field, and your sheave bowed down and worshipped mine. And they just cried, who is this kid? They were mad at him for having these dreams. He said, I saw the sun, the moon, and the stars, and they came and bowed down to me. And Jacob knew he was talking about him, his mother, and his brothers. The 11 stars being the sons. The other sons of Jacob are going to worship Joseph. And they get mad and they sell him into Egypt in that 37th chapter. And then Joseph, in chapter 38, he's in Potiphar's house. Potiphar's wife tries to seduce him. And he runs from her and she accuses Jacob of trying to rape her. Uh, Joseph, excuse me. Joseph, trying to rape her. He's put in prison in the 39th chapter. And then in the, in the, excuse me. He's in Potiphar's house in the 39th chapter. And then in the 40th chapter, he's in the prison. They put him in prison. Potiphar puts him in prison. And he interprets the butler and the baker's dream of Pharaoh. Butler the baker. A butler wasn't a guy that put his clothes on him and tied his shoes. Butler was a cupbearer, the taster of the wine. And he interprets their dreams. They kill the baker. They raise the butler up, restore him back to the king. And the Pharaoh is having these dreams. He has two dreams. And the butler says, oh, I've forgotten there's a man in prison that can interpret dreams. So he comes out before Pharaoh interprets the dream. The Pharaoh says, we're going to put this man in charge of the land. He's told me that we're going to have seven good years and seven bad years of famine. So he makes Joseph the highest man in Egypt except for himself, and you're in charge of everything in Egypt other than my wife and my family. I'll give you my ring. You stamp it wherever it's necessary, and you are the authority of Egypt, Joseph. And guess what happens? They have this famine in the land and his brothers come over and they fall down and bow down to him just like the sheaf bowed down to his sheaf. And then, of course, we know the story. Joseph, after the, all the years in his little episode with his brothers accusing them of being spies and then the little trick where he puts the diviner's cup in the sack of, of uh, Benjamin... And then he finally reveals himself and says, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. And they can't speak. They're going, this is the man of Egypt. Well, then Joseph is sold into bondage. Not Joseph, excuse me. Exodus, the first chapter. You end up Genesis. You get to the 50th chapter. And when you get to chapter 50, Joseph dies. Joseph dies. And Jacob has died just before that. In Exodus, the first chapter, you find Israel is put into bondage. A new Pharaoh rises it up that doesn't know Joseph, so they're put in bondage. And they're in bondage for 400 years from that first chapter of Exodus. Most of the 400 years passes in the, in the first chapter of Exodus. That's when they pass. There's no account of the 400 years. Those are 400 years of silence. And in all that time, Israel has practically forgotten God, and God causes Moses to be born in Exodus, the second chapter, and then he starts his mountain experience. Exodus, the third chapter, God talks to him out of a burning bush. He says, I want you to go tell Pharaoh, you let Pharaoh, let my people go. Israel is my son, my firstborn, and God begins these ten plagues, ten plagues upon Egypt, and God says, I'm going to harden Pharaoh's heart. God hardened his heart. Pharaoh did not harden his own heart. Whom he will, he hardeneth. He made Pharaoh calloused when God says, I'm going to bring all these plagues and I'm going to kill all these Egyptians. Did God love the Egyptians? No, he didn't love the Egyptians. He loved his wife, the church, and gave himself for her, nobody else, in Egypt... Who did that lamb 
the lamb that he had to place the blood upon the doorpost at the last or the tenth plague of Egypt, that was called a Passover. And God says, when I see the blood on the doorpost of the house houses of the Israelites, I will pass over you. The death angel will not kill the firstborn in the house. Who is that blood shed for in Egypt? For Israel, his wife, the church, it wasn't shed for the Egyptians. God has got a family that he shed his blood for. He died for their sin. He died in place of them dying so that we don't have to die. And that blood was only for the kingdom of God, wasn't it? That's predestination, isn't it? Now, they leave Egypt. I put things like this on the board, and I say this is a this is a uh, summary of the Bible. And people will write and say, "You're very arrogant." Say, "I'm summarizing the Bible. This is exactly what happened." What do you want? It's. I don't have time to go into all the details. When I went through Genesis, it took me two and a half years. We went into a million details, didn't we? You want to learn the book of Genesis, watch our Genesis series. You're going to see things you never saw before. You have already tonight seen things you hadn't seen till you got here, right? I, when I first heard predestination, I was about 21. That was about 1960. And I began to realize, always been a math student, I always loved math, any kind of math found my algebra, high school algebra, first year algebra card the other day. And I remember it had all A's on it, except I remember one of the final exams really upset me because I made a 93. I got upset at that. I'll never forget. I thought I just goofed up and I should have made a 98 or a 99. And that would bother me. Now, I didn't do that in all my classes, just if I thought it was important. <laughs> Or if I liked it, if I liked it. So I began to realize when I heard predestination that God doesn't love everybody, that he's chosen us and him before the foundation of the world. People ask me, how do you study? Very intensely. I mean, I'm drilling through my books. It's just intense. I believe intensity is it. I'll put it like this. Concentration is what will make you learn. But you can't concentrate until you realize how important it is to learn something. Perhaps this will help somebody. I didn't, I wouldn't try to pass, wouldn't try to make good grades in chemistry. I didn't think it was important. So I'd make passing grades. I made a, a B, a B, and then I made an F the third term. And the teacher said, Jimmy, you're going to have to, you're going to have to come back to school in the summer if you don't do something. I said, Okay. So I just gave her a B. I mean, if that's what I wanted to do, I would do it. But I didn't think everything else was important. And I tell young people this. Everything is important. Your physics is important. Your chemistry is important. How many messages have we done on biblical, chem biblical chemistry, biblical biology? Everything is important. If I'd only known, I'd take Latin and Spanish and everything else. There was no demand for a second language in 1953 and 54 nobody cared but i tell all young people learn everything you can learn because if you learn that puts you in charge doesn't it and i learned that later in life to learn everything i can learn learn about the bible and there's nobody going to be tripping you up whenever i say these preachers are lying i mean they are out and out lying there's no such thing as faith healing. Every time the Bible says thy faith has made thee whole, the word whole is sozo, it is the word saved every time. People get mad at me for calling down preachers that lie. You know how many times false teachers are mentioned in the Bible? Over and over and over and over and over, hundreds of times, God alludes to these people that are lying about his word. He said, I will kill these people. 
I don't like preachers. I, I don't understand. Where do people think all these many will come in my name saying I am Christ and shall deceive many? Where are they? They're in the world today. It's Billy Graham. It's Charles Stanley. It's Kenneth Copeland. It's Creflo Dollar. If you believe Creflo Dollar, you've got to be out of your mind. Creflo Dollar is one of the lyingest people walking, having people run down to the altar and throwing money. He's saying, come on money, come on money, and people running down there and throwing money on his altar. That has nothing to do with Jesus. They never talk about a daily cross, death to self, self-denial. They never, ever talk about being hated by the world. That's When you go to John 15, starting in verse 18, if the world hated me, it has to hate you. You don't hear any of them talk about that, do you? If it persecuted me, it'll persecute you. Did they persecute Jesus? They hated Him for His words. They chased Paul. We've been on... Paul and Peter in the book of Acts and how they're running for their lives. They're chasing them, trying to kill them. And these were the religious people. I, I just, I am appalled at the ignorance of the preachers in America. I've been a believer for about 60, 6, 67 years since I was 7 or 8. I just don't understand the preachers. I've traveled all over America, hundreds of churches across America. I never met one preacher I thought had good sense. Not one. I'm talking about biblical sense. That was back in the 60s. Now, what I want us to do, we're working our way through. And we've gotten to the 12th chapter of Exodus. That's the last or the 10th plague. It's called the Passover. And the next morning they leave Egypt. Leave Egypt. In the 14th chapter, they're crossing the Red Sea. Crossing Red Sea. And they begin to go down here into the wilderness. Here's, here's, the, here's the Mediterranean Sea. Here's Israel. They didn't call it Israel then. They called it the land of Canaan. And here's the, the Delta land. This is Egypt. And here they're going to cross the Red Sea and head off into this wilderness down here. And they headed down to Sinai. Now the whole idea of Sinai is to get the law of God or the commandments, and there's going to be 613, they're going to get this law from God, all the thou shalt nots and the thou shalts, whatever you're supposed to do, and they're going to be in this wilderness for 40 years. I keep saying, this wilderness is a picture of us coming out of our sin or darkness Egypt is the picture of darkness, the same thing you had in that second verse of Genesis. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the surface of the deep. Then they're going to leave Egypt, come across the Red Sea, come down here into Sinai. And they, this is called the mountain of God. Mount of God. They get to the mountain of God in the 18th chapter Moses goes up on the mountain in the 19th chapter, gets the commandments of God written on tables of stone. Remember, this is the ones written on tables of stone there in the 9th chapter, 9th chapter of Deuteronomy 9. This is the written on tables of stone and His law is written on tables of our heart. This is where they're headed right here. This is where Israel is going. They're going to the land of Canaan. Later on it will be called the land of Israel. And it will be made up of the twelve sons of Jacob. And each one of them had a tribe. And they'll be a nation within themselves. Now. They're going to wander through here. Where we have gotten to. We've gotten up to chapter 20. Which is the Ten Commandments. 
How much time do I have, Mike? All right. I had that the last time I asked you, back Sunday night. All right. Now, I want us to go back over to the 21st chapter. What I'm going to do, I'm not going to get through this if I don't just read some to you and comment on it. We're never going to get through it. It's We're looking, we're headed through Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. These five books are called by the Jews Torah. We call them Pentateuch. Sometimes the Jews would refer to them as the law. All the rest of the Bible they would call the prophets. But in some of the prophets you also find law of God. So we have to classify the law and the prophets all as one book in the Jewish mind. Now, let's go over here to the 21st chapter. We've gone through the 20th chapter. We've gone through it because the first four commandments, to love the Lord your God, have no other gods, not making any graven images, not taking the name of the Lord of God in vain, remembering the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The first four laws, first four commandments. is about loving God. Love God. And the second six commandments, six and four add up to ten, the second six commandments, or the second set of commandments, in the 20th chapter, is about loving your neighbor. And this is what Jesus said He's, well, this is what Paul said in Galatians 5.14. All the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love is agape. That's walking in the commandments of God. If you love your neighbor, you walk in all God's commandments. We've got them written in fleshy tables of our hearts. It's the inner man that will be walking in them, and the outer man is going to have to die over a long period of time. That takes a lifetime to die. So the second ten, in fact, when the lawyer in Luke the 10th chapter came to Jesus, a lawyer wasn't a lawyer like down here at one of these towers downtown. He was a, a man who knew the law of God. He was actually a scribe. Scribes were the top set of Pharisees. Pharisees were head of the temple, they were supposed to sit in Moses' seat, that 24th chapter of Matthew says. But the scribes, all scribes were Pharisees, but all Pharisees weren't scribes. It's like, oh, all Shriners are Masons, but all Masons are not Shriners. You know what I'm saying. So the scribes were the top line. They were called lawyers. They were the men with the most power in Israel. The Pharisees would get together and vote, but sometimes it would say Pharisee when he was a scribe also. So, where was I? Now, I was going to say something. I forgot what I was going to say. Now, then he goes on to say, Honor father and mother, that's your neighbor. Thou shalt not kill, that's your neighbor. Thou shalt not commit adultery, that's your neighbor. Thou shalt not steal, that's your neighbor. Well, the lawyer came to Jesus, excuse me, I remember now. And he said, which is the first and great commandment? And Jesus said, you know what it is. He said, to love the Lord thy God and thy neighbor as thyself. That's what the lawyer said, the scribe. Jesus said, you said it right. And then he said, who is my neighbor? And he tells him that, story of the good samaritan and he says at the end of the story which was neighbor to him that fell among thieves he didn't say the man that fell among thieves was the neighbor he said which of the three the levite or the priest or the samaritan which you hate so bad the man who gave him what he needed and you keep calling me a samaritan man, 
boy, the Pharisee didn't want to. He didn't, that lawyer didn't want to say, I suppose, the Samaritan. But it was like poison in his mouth. He, they hated Samaria. It was northern Israel. They said it was a mixed religion up there. Then he says, Thou shalt not bear false witness. Don't lie. You're not supposed to be lying about anything. We're going we're gonna to get into the law here, and you're going to see that it's an example of how we should live. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 3.16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God-breathed, and it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. Let me ask you something. When we get to naming all these laws, is that Scripture? It's profitable. I've been wrestling with how in the world am I going to teach all these detail laws I'm not going to teach all of them we're going to read through them I'm going to comment on them as we go and I got to thinking we're going to see a lot of things about the temple in numbers now I'm not going to go into all the numbers we're going to see a lot of things we're going to see the veils and see the curtains made and they're going to have dimensions now we'd have to we would have to dissect the temple and get all of the curtains exactly right as you're sitting out here and all these curtains and how they were built and the badger skin, skins dyed red on the top of the ark, the badger skins. Badger skins dyed red. I believe that's a picture of the blood of Christ over the, over the temple we're going to have to get the dimensions of the brazen sea and this altar of incense up here and all these curtains and they hang on these hooks and you've got all kinds of, you just got hundreds of them and they're made up of certain lengths. We're not going to be able to go through all that. It, it would be next to impossible. I'm going to have to study another 50 years before I can even get started a little bit of but we're going to have colors. We're going to have, actually the Bible spells it C-O-L-O-U-R-S. And the word, the common word for color is the word A-Y-I-N. I-N is the word I. We've talked about that many times. The I-N was the I. And when you see colors, you don't see colors. You see a refraction. You don't see shapes. You do not see shapes. You see a refraction of colors in your eye, and the part you don't see is the what you. The part's not there is the one you see. Yeah, uh, we need to go into that further later. And everything. You go into the primary colors. Uh, red, yellow, blue. And you come up with all the other colors. And I went through a, a, mess, a series called The Eyes of the Lord. And we went into colors. We went into the eye. When the Bible says, Israel is the apple of my eye, in Zechariah, the second chapter, apple is the word baba. And the word means pupil. The pupil of the eye, the only purpose of the pupil is to have an opening in the eye so the light can go in there. And it can be refracted or separated by the cones that are in the back of the eye. There's hundreds of thousands of cones. They're hexagon shaped. Hexagonal shaped prisms. Boy, that takes us into a lot more than I want to talk about right now. I don't even have time to get started. These cones start refraction of colors. And there's the main cone in the back of the eye. It's called the yellow spot. Yellow spot or the fovea or fovea centralis, O-V-E-A. Now, the reason I know what that is is I got a book called Gray's Anatomy. You can pull it out. That's not a TV show. That's a... Uh, book where if you go to school to take nursing or something you'll buy Gray's Anatomy and you'll study it and get the parts of the body and the anatomy and the eye and the circulatory system and the and the 
your neurologic neurological system and your pulmonary system and so forth. And uh, that's the fovea centralis, and you got all these other, other. Oh, by the way, the inner part of the retina, the inner lining of the retina is called Jacob's membrane. And I don't even want to get into that. It take all night long. But anyway, we're going to get into colors. There's royal colors. Purple is a royal color. Only rich, rich people could wear purple. That's because off the island, off, not island, off the country of what we call Lebanon, off the, off the, off of Lebanon here, well, they did have one island out there. It was an island at one time. It was called Tyre. Tyre was an island until Alexander the Great came down to conquer, and they couldn't get out to the island. That was the capital city. So he built, took months and months and months to build a, a land bridge out there so he could conquer them. And whenever you see, when you see Tyre, it's like this. And the Bible says that, that the, in Ezekiel, boy, I'm getting off on a lot of things, 28th chapter, that the anointed cherub that covereth was in the garden with God, and he dwelt in the midst of the sea. Well, the prince of Tyre, prince of Tyre, and Tyre was one of the mainstays, one of the headquarters for fire worship. So the prince of Tyre, which was Jezebel's father, they brought this down into Israel, brought this fire worship from Tyre down here. And that's how Christmas or fire worship got to Israel. Baal in the grove is called Baal in the grove up here. And the only two men that are... Huh? So where does purple come from? What is what? Where does purple come from? Oh, I was going to tell you. <laughs> purple, when Lydia was a seller of purple and Paul met her on a creek bank outside of, uh, uh, outside of Philippi, when he met her on a creek bank, she was... He met her over here at Philippi and she was a seller of purple. To sell purple, you had to know a lot of languages, lots of gloss and lots of dialects. Lots of tongues. Lots of tongues, lots of dialects and gloss. Because you could only sell to the rich. If you got caught wearing a purple robe, they'd put you in jail till they found out where you got it and where you stole it. Because the way they made purple, they had these mollusks. A mollusk is a little shellfish. Had these little mollusks off the coast of Tyre, all up and down here, around this area, around Phoenicia or Tyre and Sidon, what we call Lebanon, and it would take thousands of these little mollusks to take one little drop of purple out of a gland to dye one garment. That's why in the 18th chapter, of Revelation when the Bible is naming all the things that the merchants of the earth went after. Look at Revelation 18. And Babylon was the mother of harlots. Demon, Damonion, they were started at Babylon and they were, uh, that was the beginning of all idolatry. It was all about self. When we see, and Babylon is called a proud mountain, God says, I'm going to make you a burnt mountain. You've been a destroying mountain. You've destroyed the earth with all of its pride. And he says, when we see this mountain burning, here in, he said, you've lived deliciously in verse 9, means to be in a strain. It says the same thing in verse 7. When you see the smoke of her burning, that's a fulfillment of the verse in the 51st chapter of Jeremiah that says, I'm going to make you a burnt mountain. Standing afar off for fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come, and the merchants of the earth, what do they do? They sell and distribute fortunes, don't they? Shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise anymore. There's no more buying and selling when Babylon goes down. 
That's going to be the end of time. The merchandise of. Here's the list of the best things you could have in the first century. Gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, fine linen, and purple. Boy, that looks like a funny word until you know where it comes from and what it's talking about. If you got caught wearing purple, you could get put in jail for a long time because they believed if you were poor, you stole it because it was a very high dollar item, only royalty. So whenever we get into purple in the Old Testament, it wasn't a common cloth. It came out one little tiny drop. It take thousands and thousands of those mollusks to make one purple garment. Uh -huh. Oh, the merchants in verse 15, the merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand up far off for the fear of her torment and weeping and waiting. Look at Acts 16. I'll just go ahead and show you this. Acts 16. Verse 14. A certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple. That's why they put this in here. You wouldn't have any idea. If you're just reading the Bible, I don't have to read anything but the Bible. If that's all you read, you're going to look at seller of purple. Who cares about purple? Of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended, whose heart the Lord opened, whose heart the Lord opened. Lydia was going around talking to rich people and kings all the time. That's the only people that bought purple. But you, I've had people say, I don't read nothing but the Bible. Yeah, and you're stupid too. What are you going to do with purple when you get to it? That was my high school color. Ever loyal to the purple, grand old team are we. Walmart's better than the rest. Fight, oh, fight, fight, fight for victory. And <laughs> Oh, that was my college's color too, Texas A&M. All right. Now, am I out of time? Yeah. Well, at least we found out about purple, didn't we? <laughs> well, let's pray. Father, thank you for truth. Thank you for your word. We pray that you'll cause us to bow to your will in everything we do. I pray for the flock here that you'll, Lord, deal with their hearts and crush them under your hand and cause them to grow in faith. God will praise and glorify you for all things. You're doing everything in our lives. Lord, just give us strength to bear up under it. Lead us to your leg. Lord, we thank you for the great opportunity that you've given us in this ministry. We pray you'll open up many more doors. And we'll praise you for everything in Christ's name. Amen. I was going to get into the 21st chapter. I didn't get there.
Mario? Which is good. Yeah. 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 Yeah.